History of the Hungarian People's Republic. The Communist and Social Democrat Parties Merge In the course of the revolutionary movement in Hungary, the Social Democrats had very noticeably split into a left wing and a right wing. Reactionaries had suffered many defeats, and as a result, the Social Democrat left was much stronger than the right. The Social Democrat left wing supported collaboration with the communists and had become closer and closer to communism ideologically. They supported socialist construction and class struggle and held Marxist positions on various issues. The Social Democrat left represented the old Marxist tradition within social democracy. Quote, the Social Democratic Party, after being driven underground during the Second World War, had been able to reactivate over 350,000 members, mainly industrial workers, by the end of 1945 with its slogan, Democracy Today, Socialism Tomorrow. It supported the idea of a people's republic, far-reaching democratic reforms, the nationalization of key industries and the confiscation of the great estates. The party leadership frustrated both ex-ministers Koroi Payer's attempt early in 1946 to return the party to an anti-communist line and the negotiations held in autumn of 1947 aimed at achieving closer cooperation of all anti-communist forces under the leadership of the Smallholders Party. Unquote. Quote, Regarding foreign policy, the SDP left wing preferred an all-out pro-Soviet line. Unquote. Quote, Among the Social Democrats, the upper hand was gained by the faction in the party leadership, which was openly sympathetic to the communist call to defend the unity of the working class in its struggle against reactionary elements and those wishing to restore capitalism. Unquote. Quote, as a result of the acceleration of revolutionary progress, the members and officials of the Social Democratic Party came still closer in ideology to the Communist Party. It was increasingly recognized that the fusion of the two parties should not be delayed too long. The number of those who went over to the Communist Party was also increasing. The right-wing elements in the Social Democratic Party were considerably upset by these events and fought against them because further revolutionary transformations and the unification of the two parties would be tantamount to a complete political defeat for them. The right wing of the Social Democratic Party in Hungary launched a campaign to induce the party executive to take more vigorous action against any efforts to unite the two parties. On 15th October, a memorandum signed by 34 officials of the party organizations of 16 factories in Budapest and its vicinity, and of three district party organizations, was submitted to the party leadership. They did not touch on a single issue of reconstruction or the struggle against reaction. They reproached the party executive for failing to fight against the Communist Party with sufficient vigor to protect and increase the social democratic positions. They demanded the removal of the left-wing activists from the party center and their replacement with their own people. As befits persons who were having the ground swept away from under their feet, they raised the idea that if their demands were not satisfied, it would be better for the SDP to dissolve of its own accord. Events progressed towards the unification of the two workers' parties, but those who submitted this memorandum before the dissolution of the party to any possible unification with the Communist Party. The leadership of the Social Democratic Party considered the internal situation of the party and the memorandum submitted on 18th October. Antal Ban observed that there were some expecting an American-Soviet war and an American victory and wanted to see a pro-American policy. Unquote. Quote, In October 1947, at a session of the Social Democrat Party's executive, the right wing demanded that the left wing leaders be ousted and that the Social Democrats break with the policy of cooperation with the Hungarian Communist Party. The idea that the Social Democrat Party should dissolve itself as a gesture of protest was also raised. The left wing launched a counteroffensive in response. Unquote. Matyas Rakosi said, quote, the outcome of over three years of struggle is that the working class and the laboring peasantry hold power in Hungary. During the past three and a half years, the working class, headed by our party, has proved its ability to govern the country. It has become the leading and decisive force and is recognized as such by the overwhelming majority of the people. 
This recognition brought into the party this spring thousands of social democratic workers. The correct policy of the communists isolated the right social democrats and brought about healthy conditions for the fusion of the two workers' parties. Unquote. Quote, the left-wing leaders of the Social Democratic Party were justified in emphasizing that the right-wing faction was placing the Social Democratic positions in jeopardy because it set their party against the revolutionary interests of the working class, which had at last achieved power. In the meantime, an increasing number of people left the Social Democratic Party, which was losing its prestige, and joined the Communist Party, which was gaining prestige. By January and February 1948, this transfer of allegiance was assuming the proportions of a landslide. At the same time, even more people simply quit the party. Party membership and the party's mass influence were rapidly diminishing. It was then that the left-wing leaders of the Social Democratic Party recognized unification must not be delayed any longer, and all opponents of this move should be energetically countered. Political unity of the working class should take place in Hungary, with the active collaboration of the Social Democratic Party, rather than at the cost of its disintegration. This, however, made it imperative that the party should be cleansed of anti-communist elements. In mid-February 1948, there was an open break between the representatives of the left and right wings of the leadership of the Social Democratic Party. Anna Ketli, Imri Selig and their associates, together with the centrists who joined them, including Antal Ban, were forced to abdicate their leading positions in the party. Following this, several right-wing and center members of the party executive also resigned, some of them because they opposed the SDP's support of the merger, and others because they did not want to hamper unification and expected to facilitate its preparation and implementation by standing aside." Unquote. Already previously, right-wing Social Democrat leader Koroi Peyer had united with right-wing elements in the smallholder party and tried to launch an anti-communist campaign inside the Social Democrats. However, it failed and he was expelled. Anti-communist historian George Shefflin stated the following, quote, Payer launched an open campaign against the pro-communist trend within the SDP, but was defeated and this left him and the Social Democratic right isolated in the party. He was reproved and eventually left it to join the Hungarian Radical Party." Unquote. Josef Revai said, quote, The leader of the right wing, Koroi Peer, withdrew from the Social Democratic Party and ran on the ticket of one of the bourgeois parties. This, of course, gave rise to confusion among the Social Democrats. The Social Democrats and bourgeois parties fought for the vote of the petty bourgeoisie, with the result that the Social Democrats lost heavily in this struggle. Unquote. Or, as the anti-communist historian Jörg Hoensch stated, quote, When the right-wing Social Democrats opposed a merger, their spokesmen, who included the former government ministers Koroi Peer, A. Ketli, F. Zeder, and A. Bahn, were expelled following an internal party struggle, which lasted until February 1948. Unquote. Matyas Rakoshi said, quote, the exposure of the right social democrats made our social democratic comrades realize that the existence of rival working class parties was altogether unnecessary, and that this inter-party rivalry was most detrimental not only to the interests of the working people, but to Hungarian democracy as a whole. A spontaneous movement for the formation of a united workers' party gained ground among the working class. Thousands of social democratic comrades expressed their desire to join our party. For the time being, we have stopped recruiting new members, but thousands of people are impatiently waiting for the day when entry into the party will be renewed. Unquote. Quote, At the beginning of 1948, a rapidly growing number of Social Democrat members decided to switch to the Communist Party. By February, the flow of Social Democrats to the Communist Party reached such proportions that the Hungarian Communist Party Political Committee was forced to order a temporary clampdown on new membership. The Social Democrat Party met in Congress on 6th to 8th of March 1948. This Congress resulted in complete victory for the left wing. The resolution adopted at the Congress 
stipulated that the new party leadership begin talks immediately with the leadership of the Hungarian Communist Party with a view to creating the ideological, political and organizational conditions necessary for the forming of a United Workers' Party. Unquote. Historian Andrew Girgi stated, quote, the 36th Annual Congress of the Social Democratic Party meeting in Budapest in February 1948 ended with a widely publicized and spectacular victory of its extreme left-wing leaders over the more conservative right-wing members, who seem to have been completely discredited. The final outcome of the Social Democratic Congress was a dramatic decision of the party leadership to liquidate its moderate members and to integrate its activities with those of the Communist Party. Unquote. At the founding congress of the new party, Rakoshi said, quote, The congresses of the workers' parties, the communist and socialist parties of Hungary, adopted a unanimous decision to unite. This historic event is an occasion for joy and satisfaction, not only to the working people of Hungary, but also to the supporters of democratic progress throughout the world. In line with this decision, which marks a new epoch in the history of our country, we have gathered here to announce the fusion of the two fraternal parties, to discuss the problems of work of the new party, and also the draft program and statutes of the party, which have been submitted to the Congress for consideration." Unquote. Challenges involved in an underground party becoming a mass party The merger of the two workers' parties happened on the basis of Marxism-Leninism, the merger could be worthwhile only on such a basis. Rakoshi stated, quote, One of the prerequisites for the fusion was that the social democratic comrades should adhere to the position of Marxism-Leninism. In accordance with this, we have drafted a joint program which we submit to the Congress for consideration. This program not only analyzes international and domestic problems in the spirit of the teachings of Marx, Engels, Lenin, Stalin, but also outlines the tasks confronting the United Party, tasks which the United Workers' Party must complete without any loss of time. It is of vital importance to us to turn the party into a truly monolithic organization, imbued with a single spirit, a single desire and a single will. It is imperative that the comrades who have come from the Social Democratic Party quickly master the theory of Marxism-Leninism and accept Iron Party discipline. Quote, what was the party like that came into being with the fusion of the Communist Party and the Social Democratic Party? The United Party which came into being was a Marxist-Leninist party. It was an important question to what extent the vanguard character of the party would prevail, not only in its role in the life of society, but also in its organizational composition. In addition to the genuine vanguard, to what extent would it rally the sympathizers, in other words, the people who supported the policy of the party, but did not come up yet to the requirements of party membership. It is a universal experience that a legal revolutionary party, when it becomes a mass party, inevitably includes in its ranks, side by side with the vanguard, a part of the sympathizing masses, who constitute a constant source for refilling and strengthening the party. This also happened to the Communist Party, a large number of sympathizers were persuaded to join. This was one of the results of party rivalry, of a situation when even the number of the registered members of each party figured in the struggle for positions. Consequently, there were many formal admissions to membership, the sort of joining which did not mean more for the entrant than a single act which was not even followed by the payment of the monthly membership dues. This kind of formal membership was even more extensive in the Social Democratic Party." Unquote. When the Hungarian Communist Party emerged from the underground and became a legal party, it recruited members very actively. It was important to draw as many workers, peasants and intellectuals, as well as all partisan fighters and anti-fascist fighters into the party. It was important to increase the party's membership, because this increased its prestige and influence in the elections, and the political struggle of the time. However, this created its own challenges. First of all, it was difficult for some veterans of the underground party to adapt to the new conditions. Some members held the ultra-left view that they should have simply taken power in a violent revolution right away in 1944-45, to 45, 
and did not see the peaceful path to socialism as a possibility. This is because they didn't analyze the concrete conditions of Hungary at the time. Another challenge was that so many new members were recruited into the party. New recruits were bound to be of lower quality and ideologically weaker. The Hungarian party quickly grew from mere thousands to tens of thousands, and in a few years, hundreds of thousands. This was not entirely unique though. The Finnish Communist Party also only had thousands of members when it was underground, but still had tens of thousands or even hundreds of thousands of supporters. When the party became legal, it also had a massive influx of those who had always supported them, but had been too afraid or unable to join the party when it was underground. Still, the Hungarian party recruited much more actively than most communist parties, and when it was combined with the Social Democrats, its membership reached as many as 800,000 in a country of 9 million people. In early 1948, party members were told to apply for new membership cards. In this process, 150,000 inactive members who didn't renew their membership were removed. As the merging of the two parties was happening, 40,000 people had left the Social Democrats and joined the Communists. A temporary ban on new members was adopted. Focus now shifted away from quantity to quality. Right-wingers from the Social Democrats were not allowed to join the new party, and ideological education was stepped up. In his various speeches and articles, Rakoshi gave a thorough analysis of the issues related to the merging of the two workers' parties. He said, quote, It is too early as yet to predict what the membership of the party will be, but it will certainly exceed the million mark. This contains the danger of inflating the party and of obliterating the demarcation line between the party and the working class. That is why we have considered it necessary to introduce stricter rules when accepting new members and in this way ensure the healthy growth of the party." Unquote. Quote, it would be incorrect, of course, to draw a parallel between the Communist Party of Hungary and the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, but what can be said is that in our party there are relatively, and in absolute figures, all the more so, considerably fewer communists possessing a clear understanding of Marxist-Leninist theory, and who could, in all justice, be considered members of the general staff of the working people. From this it follows that, comparatively speaking, our party should have considerably fewer members than the Communist Party of the Soviet Union Bolsheviks. But what is the actual state of affairs? Last autumn, party membership reached 800,000, and notwithstanding thousands of exclusions in connection with the exchange of membership cards, is now reaching the million mark. In view of the forthcoming fusion of the Communist and Social Democrat parties, and the mass entry of peasants into the party, this growth will continue in the United Party. Our party is not only made up of the vanguard detachment of the working class, but also includes the absolute majority of industrial workers. How did it come about that our party found itself developing in this way? At first, we strove to get the most conscious workers, peasants and progressive intellectuals, who had had some experience of struggle, to join our ranks. To ensure this, we accepted members only on the basis of a detailed questionnaire, backed with recommendations by two veteran members of the party. However, we quickly realized that by following this procedure, we remained in the minority compared with the Social Democrats and other parties which were competing with us. These workers, peasants and intellectuals who were eager to join the party because they sympathized with the Soviet Union, the Soviet Army, or with the vigorous and selfless activity of our party, these people, in their overwhelming majority, had never taken part in the labor movement and wanted to master communist theory as members of our party. When we did not accept these sympathizers into the party, disillusioned and hurt, they joined the Social Democratic Party, which had a united front with us and which did not follow a line of such strict selection. The result was that the Social Democrat Party grew by leaps and bounds and soon outnumbered us. In the summer of 1945, for instance, it frequently happened in the course of the factory committee elections that Social Democrat comrades, using the argument that they had double our membership in the factories, insisted on getting two-thirds of the majority. Moreover, the right Social Democrats, referring to this fact, made even more extravagant demands on us. They used this argument in the autumn of 1945, at the time of the general election, when they prevented a common election list being put forward. 
The immediate effect of this rivalry was that we opened wide the party doors, which explains the rapid increase in its membership. We were not happy about this, and we recognized the dangers inherent in the influx into our party. Unquestionably, many people have come into our party, and this is even more true of the Social Democrat Party, for whom it would have been much better had they first passed through a definite preparatory school of socialism in the trade unions or in other mass organizations, and had not immediately joined the party, which they can thus directly influence. Unquote. Quote, Comrade Stalin has pointed out how dangerous it is to turn the party into a scattered, amorphous, disorganized formation, which loses itself in a sea of sympathizers, and obliterates the demarcation line between the party and the class, and bypasses the task of the party to raise the unorganized masses to the level of a vanguard detachment. We fail to take full account of the danger that a quantitative increase can lead to a deterioration of quality. We were misled by the circumstance that, despite its swollen ranks, our party was able to carry out its tasks, to create and consolidate the people's democracy. At the same time, however, there were signs that the existence of a vast number of members lacking communist education was beginning to hamper the party in carrying out its vanguard role. A number of recent symptoms show that at critical moments some of its members allowed themselves to be influenced by non-class conscious elements and even enemies of democracy, it should be noted that careerists of all kinds and enemies are now trying to get into the party. Our enemies are trying to get into the party in order to cause us a lot of harm. The party, continued Stalin, could not but know that it was strong not only in the number of its members, but above all in their quality. The Bolshevik party combated this danger in various ways. Party purge, temporary non-acceptance of new members, but mainly by adopting a series of measures designed to raise the ideological level of the party. The composition of the party must be steadily improved, wrote Stalin at the time, by raising the level of the party members' consciousness and by accepting into the party on an individual basis only comrades who have been tested and are devoted to the cause of communism. It is necessary, said Stalin, to extend the propaganda idea of Marxism-Leninism to raise the theoretical level and political tempering of our cadres. In the main, we too must take similar measures. The task will be much easier during the registration of members in the United Party when, fortunately, the two-party rivalry will play no role. Now that the two workers' parties are combining and the dangerous element of rivalry is eliminated, it is high time that the party become a party in accordance with Marxist-Leninist theory. For the purpose of raising the ideological level of the party, the question of study must be given priority. The political bureau has decided that the six-month party school be changed into a one-year school for 50 students. The six-month school will be attended by 100 members annually. The number of three-month courses will be increased to six. About 10,000 party members will attend the weekly party school in the course of a year. We shall increase the number of courses and promote individual studies. Each year, every party worker must master in independent study at least the material of the three-month course. Naturally, members of the United Party will attend these party schools. Apart from this, the special commission handling the matter of study for the two parties is now dealing with the question of refresher courses for the Social Democratic Comrades. We are devoting special attention to the education and discipline of the party functionaries. Unquote. Quote, the question of the fusion of the two parties was decided at the recent Congress of the Social Democratic Party. However, as stressed by the leading Social Democratic comrades, the ideological basis for fusion must be Marxism-Leninism, so that in a few months' time, thousands of former Social Democratic members of the United Party will be fully justified in demanding that we acquaint them with the teachings of Marxism further elaborated by Lenin and Stalin. But this is only one aspect of the task facing us. Apart from the Social Democratic Comrades, our party is being joined by the people from the peasant population and by the intelligentsia. For instance, in the province of Zemplin alone, 5,000 small peasants, teachers and doctors joined our ranks in the month that preceded the closing of recruitment. These peasant people have come to us not because they are acquainted with Marxist-Leninist theory, but because of their convictions which have taken shape in the course of three years' observation and experience, that our party is the most consistent and honest party, 
is the party that most successfully represents and defends the interests of the working people of Hungary. These peasants and representatives of the intelligentsia will bring with them not only their sentiments of sympathy for our party, but also various prejudices and mistaken conceptions. Unless we take timely measures to provide thousands of new people who will be joining our ranks during the coming weeks and months with the minimum theoretical and ideological education, then the theoretical level of our party, none too high at the moment, may be lowered still more." Unquote. The two parties united on a very equal basis. First, local chapters of Social Democrats and Communists united, then district levels and finally highest levels. The Social Democrats had expelled their right-wingers and now decisively abandoned the opportunism of the Second International and returned to their revolutionary Marxist roots. That is why the merging on Marxist-Leninist principles was possible. It would still take time to develop all these elements into a party of truly iron unity and high theoretical caliber. Although political and theoretical education is the most important way of improving the quality of party members, it was also absolutely necessary to purge the party of right-wingers, careerists and other harmful elements. Rakoshi said, quote, As is known, when we carried through the exchange of membership cards, new cards were not issued to thousands of former party members whom we considered unworthy of the party's confidence. Unquote. He also said, quote, The Social Democratic Party is removing the right elements from its ranks, between eight to 9,000 have been expelled already. A thorough purge has been carried out in the parliamentary fraction, where 33 out of 68 deputies have been recalled or expelled from the party. When the fusion of the two workers' parties is accomplished, the new party will hold 46% of the seats in parliament." Unquote. Later, at the second congress of the Hungarian Working People's Party, Rakoshi said, quote, in order to eliminate undesirable elements, we decided upon the supervision of membership. This supervision, which was carried out in our party after suitable preparation in the first half of 1949, extended to more than one million members. Of these, we excluded 190,407 members and qualified another 125,672 as candidates to membership. Besides, there were many tens of thousands of members who did not report for supervision." Unquote. The result of the merger of the two parties was that communists gained the support of the absolute majority of the working class, and that social democracy was effectively eliminated as a competitor to genuine socialism, that is, to Marxism-Leninism. Right-wing social democracy still continued as an underground force which attempted to sabotage socialist construction. The new party, the Hungarian Working People's Party, was a mass Marxist-Leninist party. It was a vanguard party, although many of its new members still needed a lot of education. It was easily the largest party in the parliament, with 46% of the vote. The bulk of the Social Democrat members were loyal working class activists, and many of the left Social Democrat leaders also genuinely supported socialism and accepted Marxism. The best elements of the Social Democrats firmly joined with the Communists. Speaking about the new party, Rakoshi said, quote, When the decisive hour struck, when development put the organic implementation of working class unity on the agenda, the healthy kernel of the Social Democratic Party stood at the height of its historic task and was capable of acting correctly. The bulk of the Social Democratic Party was, in these decisive months, loyal sons of their class and people, and they sealed this loyalty with honest and sincere unity with the communists. All the successes and achievements of the two and a half years which have passed since prove that this merger was correct and healthy, have opened new sources of strength and gave new vigor to Hungarian socialist development. The fruit of this merger is our united, unbroken and great party, the Hungarian Working People's Party fighting under the banner of Lenin and Stalin, and fired with communist spirit." Unquote. Now that we've discussed the merger of the left-wing Social Democrats into the communists, let's briefly talk about the right-wing Social Democrats, who they were, where they came from, and what became of them. The Right-Wing Social Democrats As I mentioned briefly in episode 1, the right-wing Social Democrats basically acted as a fake opposition in Horthyist fascist Hungary. 
They made an agreement with the fascist government to not organize the peasants, to not organize public sector employees, to not organize political strikes, and practically to not organize strikes at all, but to prevent them. To not criticize the government, but instead defend the fascist government internationally. They defended the white terror and promised to attack the communists and all the revolutionaries and labeled them terrorists. In return, the right wing of the social democrats were allowed to operate legally and basically were able to take full control of the social democrat party and the trade unions. This agreement between the Horthy fascist government and the right-wing social democrats is known as the payer bethlen Agreement. Payer was the leader of the right-wing social democrats, and Bethlen was Horthy's prime minister. Quote, As the white terror raged, the social democratic party began negotiations with Horthy. In December 1921, they agreed that social democrats can get a few seats in the parliament, publish their newspapers censored by the government, and get amnesty for interned social democrats. However, social democrats were not the only ones interned, communists were also imprisoned, and the amnesty didn't include them. On top of that, they promised to try to get support from international social democrats for Horthy's land of white terror. Unquote. As the liberal count Koroi writes, quote, Bethlen brought the Social Democrats to heel, drawing up a secret pact with them. This pact, accepted by the Socialist Party under duress, made them agree to his franchise bill with its open, that is, non-secret, ballot for the rural districts, and his prohibition on all farm laborers' organizations. This meant the complete control of the peasantry and was of major importance to the landowner Bethlen." Unquote. Quote, in Budapest on December 22, 1921, an agreement was signed by the Prime Minister and four cabinet members on behalf of the Horthy Regency and by five leaders of the Hungarian Social Democratic Party, Messrs. Payer, Farkas, Mjakic, Popper and Bentz. Here, the delegates of the Hungarian Social Democratic Party declare that they agree to the wishes expressed by the Prime Minister, both with regard to foreign and home policy, and give assurance of fulfillment on their part. They agreed, quote, not only to abstain from all propaganda injurious to the interests of Hungary, but on the contrary, will carry on active propaganda on behalf of fascist Hungary, unquote. Conservative historian Professor C. A. McCartney writes, quote, the terms are believed to amount to the following. It was noted that large open-air meetings were prohibited, and the unions of state officials, railways, and postal workers, which had been dissolved, could not be revived. The Social Democrats agreed not to make anti-Hungarian propaganda abroad to dissipate so-called false rumors of terrorization current among foreign socialists, that is, to lie that there is no white terror, and to adopt the so-called national internal policy. They agreed to collaborate on economic policy with the national parties, to abstain from political strikes, and to refer wage disputes to arbitration. They would break with the revolutionary parties. They agreed not to extend their agitation to the agricultural laborers. They would also confine their agitation among the miners within such limits as to not endanger the continuity and measure of production. In return, the government agreed to arrest and intern none but so-called terrorists, communist agitators, and other dangerous persons, unquote, and to release right-wing social democrats. After this agreement between the right-wing social democrats and the fascist government of Horthy became known three years later, the Second International criticized it, as the social democrats belonged to the Second International, but nothing else happened. The Second International didn't expel them, and the criticism had absolutely no impact. These right-wing social democrats remained as the leaders of the party throughout the entire fascist period. When Hungary joined the Axis, Payer was the chairman of the social democrats and the leader of the only government-recognized trade union federation. They were also allowed seats in the parliament, and many of them, such as Anna Ketli, 
sat in the parliament all throughout World War II when Hungary was fighting a war of aggression on the side of Hitler. The right-wing social democrats, who it is accurate to call social fascists, that is, people who pretend to be socialists but are actually defending fascism, represented Hungary in the League of Nations and tried to act like there was no white terror and that the Hungarian fascist state really wasn't all that bad. Quote, Invariably also, Hungarian foreign delegations, as those appearing at the League of Nations, were made up largely of social democratic leaders, men such as the ubiquitous Payer or Pedel or Garami. Unquote. The job of the right-wing social democrats was to prevent strikes and to keep the workers under control. During the Great Depression, New York Times wrote in its headline of September 2nd, 1930, quote, Reds lead jobless in Budapest battle. Two die, 257 wounded. Workers erecting barricades, driven out by tanks. Socialists unable to control protests. Unquote. By Reds, the New York Times means communists, and by socialists, they mean the right-wing social democrats. In other words, the communists tried to organize workers while the right-wing social democrats sent tanks to kill them. During World War II, the right-wing social democrats were allowed to operate as helpers of the fascist war effort, and when the war had started, right-wing social democrat leader Payer wrote to Undersecretary of State Alador Bohr, quote, During the last few days, individuals have repeatedly appeared at the premises of the trade unions under my leadership, and attempted to persuade the workers present to commit various unlawful acts. I have the honor to present with respect the reports I received." Unquote. In other words, workers tried to organize against the fascist war, but Payer, the right-wing social democrat, prevented all this and instead informed the fascist authorities. At this point, it should be mentioned that there also were leftists inside the social democrat party, and even communists who had infiltrated into the party. Those leftists did try to oppose the war, and this leftist faction became more influential after the Nazi occupation of Hungary, when the Nazis banned pretty much every party, including even the Social Democrats. But the right-wing Social Democrats always cooperated with fascism to the bitter end. Quote, During the years of war, the Social Democratic apparatus, including its parliamentary delegation and its press, though exercising a critical approach, sought fundamentally, as Rustem Vambury wrote, to make the war popular with the working class." Unquote. That is, to make fascist war propaganda. When the defeat of fascism seemed imminent, the right-wing social democrats, Karoy Payer, Anna Ketli, etc., met with the right-wing leaders of the smallholder party to discuss how they should react to the fact that communists would inevitably become a legal party and a powerful force in the country. The right-wing smallholder leader Ferenc Nag writes about this in his memoirs. He says, quote, The leaders of the Social Democratic Party met with us to discuss how the parties would react to the unavoidable entry of the communists into the post-war political arena. Social Democratic leaders promised to fight any thrust of communism, and declared that their platform was general suffrage, private property, and self-government, and believed that on this basis our efforts could be coordinated." Unquote. Atherker writes, quote, This is very consequential for the post-1945 period. First of all, as Elizabeth Wiskman points out, the political reputation of the Social Democrats was soiled, and this left them in a weak position when the revolution came. More important, the Social Democratic agreement with the fascist Horthy Regency had seriously weakened all levels of working class trade union organization and had totally neglected the mass of the peasantry in the face of the vilest kind of chauvinist, anti-Semitic and fascist propaganda. There had been, therefore, a minimum of any kind of democratic or popular opposition to extreme reaction and ultranationalism. Meanwhile, the communist movement had been illegalized, its members arrested, imprisoned for long terms, executed, and, not infrequently, summarily murdered by the police, 
or other agents of the Regency, unquote. This is briefly the history of the right-wing social democrats. They were fascist collaborators and supporters of the imperialist war effort. Together with the right-wing leaders of the smallholders party, mainly Ferenc Nag, they had made a secret agreement to do everything in their power to fight communism, as Ferenc Nag admitted in his memoirs. The right-wing social democrats were an anti-communist and pro-fascist force, and they became a group of spies, saboteurs and obstructionists, hindering the Hungarian Popular Front government from the inside and working on behalf of Western, mainly American, intelligence services. As a result, some right-wing social democrats were imprisoned for espionage and conspiring against Hungary together with the American imperialists. Other right-wing social democrats escaped to America and continued working for the CIA there. Quote, 1949, September 16th, the Voice of America broadcast a statement by Karoy Payer, the right-wing social democratic traitor to the working class who had fled to the West, in which he states that the People's Democratic State order in Hungary, quote, can only be overthrown with foreign aid, unquote. This foreign aid obviously means foreign invasion and American funding of counter-revolutionary armed units, and we know this is nothing new. This is exactly the same that the right-wing leaders of the smallholders had agreed to. The liberal Count Karoy characterized the right-wing social democrats in the same way as agents of foreign imperialism. He wrote about these reactionaries that, quote, The few political emigres form an amorphous mass of all shades and parties. Fascists, royalists, social democrats, reactionaries, ex-communists and militant Catholics. They exist on hopes of war between the East and West, which might enable them to regain their lost positions. In order to live, all of them are obliged to work for the highest bidder, usually the USA." Unquote. The Hungarian government discovered that right-wing social democrat leader, quote, Karoy Payer, suggested to American diplomat McCarger that if he received American support, he would take steps to overthrow the Hungarian government and to prepare for a change of regime. The matter was also raised of Payer fleeing abroad and there forming a counter-government with American aid." Unquote. And of course, this is exactly what happened. Payer fled to America. However, the Hungarian government didn't know at the time, though perhaps they suspected it, that McCarger, who presented himself as an American diplomat, was actually an agent of the OSS and CIA, and actually even led his own organization inside Hungary, which was far more secret than a normal CIA operation. This is known, first of all, because in the 1960s, McCarger wrote a book about some of his activities. The book was published under a false name, but some people were already able to figure out that it had to be by McCarger. In 2010, documents were finally declassified, which confirmed that McCarger had led an ultra-secret spy organization in Hungary. According to his book, The Spy and His Masters, A Short Course in the Secret War, McCarger, alias Christopher Felix, led his spy organization in Hungary between 1946 and 1948. After this, he had to flee. One of McCarger's agents, codenamed Paul, was, quote, a very high member of the government, a smallholder, a lawyer by profession, and codenamed Leo, was a smallholder member of parliament. His other agents included diplomats, officials, for example, codenamed Sarah, of a nominal peasant party membership, in the political section of the foreign office, where she had access to all the section's most confidential correspondence, codenamed Sam, an official in the Communist Trade Union Council, and codename Edmund, an officer of the AVO, Hungarian Intelligence Service. Codename Guy was the holder of an important post in the National Police, and codename Anna was a monarchist who was involved with the church. They were also in contact with smallholder leader Bela Kovács and right-wing social democrat leader Karoy Payer. This American spy organization infiltrated all the main political parties, all sections of the Hungarian government and state, including even the Hungarian intelligence service and the police. 
and it organized all reactionary sections of the population, right-wing smallholders, right-wing social democrats, monarcho-fascists and reactionary priests. As MacArthur only talked about his spies with code names, most of them have never been identified. He mentions Bela Kovac and Karoy Payer with their real names, but who, for example, was codenamed Paul, a very high member of the government and a smallholder, or codenamed Leo, a smallholder member of parliament, we do not know. The conspiracy of Bela Kovac and Ferenc Nag was revealed. Kovac was arrested, and Ferenc Nag escaped to America. Payer also managed to escape, but Anna Kethley was arrested. At that point, however, the right-wingers had already lost control of the Social Democrat Party, and Kethley had even been expelled from it. It seems they got in contact with the American intelligence services exactly because they had lost the control of the party, and had no other way of clinging to power. Naturally, anti-communists like to pretend that all these people were completely innocent of any crimes, and that they were simply persecuted for some other reason. But Ferenc Nag doesn't exactly make it a secret that he was looking for the violent overthrow of the Popular Front government with American support, and neither does Karoy Payer. The OSS and later CIA agent MacArthur also admitted, although under a false name and three decades after the fact, that he had recruited Bela Kovac, Karoy Payer and Ferenc Nag. Even anti-communist historians have also admitted that Bela Kovac belonged to the illegal fascist secret society called Hungarian Unity, and that he was their infiltrator inside the government. In the end, the old right-wing leaders, quote, smallholder Bela Varga, right-wing social democrats Koroi Payer and Selik, and smallholders Suliak and Pfeiffer, later set up their counter-revolutionary headquarters, under U.S. State Department supervision in Washington. Unquote.